Well, my name is Austin, and I want to say good morning, and thank you for joining us at Experience Church Online, where you can belong even before you believe. So head on over to our website, exp.church connect, where you can learn more information about what we're building in the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, at the same time, our connection card is a great opportunity for us to learn more about you, your desires, your gifts, your passions, and how you can contribute to the community here at Experience Church. Now, before we move on in our worship experience and get to worship together through song and go into the message with Pastor Mark, I wanna give you a moment to give your tithes and your offerings. We believe at Experience Church that when you partner with us financially, you are helping to build an environment where people can build a life that matters and truly become who they were born to be. So let's pray today, and then you can give via text or online giving. Father, we thank you today for all that you've given. We know that all that we have comes from you. And so we pray today that you would stir inside of us a spirit of generosity to truly invest in the kingdom of God and in the local church. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Church Online. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here on the team. And I want to say it's been so cool meeting many of you that have been watching online for many months, now beginning to attend in person. And if you are coming and we're watching online, please come up and say hello. We'd love to get your name and hear your story and welcome you to the family at Experience. Also want to say get and stay connected. We've worked really hard to make it really easy for you to have both online and in-person gatherings virtually every day. Somebody's getting together, reading the Bible, praying, going out, having fun, just doing life together. It's so important that we get connected and we stay connected. This is how we get healthy and this is how we grow. So at Experience, what we do is we make invitations and we leave it up to you to make decisions. We invite you decide. I uh, also want to say, if you're traveling, I know many people are in the month of July. Amanda and I and our family just got back from vacation and you miss a Sunday at an in-person gathering, watch online. Stay connected here at Church Online. And when you are in town and you're able, please join us. Our in-person worship experiences have been fantastic and we've got food and we're hanging out. It feels like family reunion every week. Would love for you to be a part of it. All right, we are close to finishing up our series in Romans chapter eight. Uh, Amanda, my wife, will actually be teaching next week. And I've got a couple of the verses near the end of Romans chapter eight. We're almost through going verse by verse through one of the most important, encouraging chapters in all of the Bible. And so here we are, Romans chapter eight. We believe that all of our teachings experience, this is our goal, is that we would be biblically hopeful and practically helpful. That's what we're going after. Romans chapter eight says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or pandemic or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, Paul's quoting Psalm 44 too, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, Paul answers his rhetorical question. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let's pray. Jesus, you're the best. Speak to us today like only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm sure you've probably heard of love languages. These are like the five primary ways that we feel the most loved or we experience the most love. And and many psychologists believe that of these love languages, there's like one that is the most dominant. So I'll just make it very known to all the men. Our love language is touch. Can I get an amen? Yes, drop it in the comments. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Our love language primarily as men is touch. Maybe it's words of affirmation for you where you love to just be encouraged by people. Perhaps it's quality time where you just wanna break bread, have a meal, undivided attention, presence, just be with people. Or it could be acts of service. So it's somebody actually doing something for you or coming alongside you or helping you. And then the last one is actually Let me make sure I got them all here. I don't want to miss any. Gifts. Can't forget gifts. Some of y'all are just like, just buy me something, right? All of us have these love languages, and there's usually one that's the most dominant. And and when that language of love is spoken, we experience or we feel the most love. 
Now let's translate that into our relationship with God. How does this really work with a fully present, omnipresent, everywhere all at once God that we can't fully see in our physical world? How, how does that work with touch, right? Because he does love us through these love languages, but oftentimes we've gotta kinda of learn his spiritual language of love that communicates to us through our love languages. So does he touch us? Yes, he does. But is it like a physical touch? No, but it could be like the goosebumps that maybe you felt during worship, or perhaps others have said it feels like almost like this warm blanket of love, that he can touch us with his love. It could be words of affirmation where maybe Jesus himself doesn't actually speak directly to you physically present, but he may, maybe gives you a word of encouragement through someone that you're close to. Or maybe you're reading the Bible and there's just a, a, a verse that pops off the page. That could be a word of affirmation. This is how God loves us. Maybe it's acts of service where there's not like an angel that flies into your room and cleans it for you, but maybe there's somebody that shows up and can hang a picture for you that God actually uses people to communicate his love for us. The quality time, it could just be dinner with a friend or hanging out on a Sabbath together, whatever that may look like. And we know the gifts, right? Gifts like, yes, God gives us gifts, but some of those gifts are actually physical gifts that actually come through other people. It's not like Jesus being Amazon Prime. It's actually somebody that he uses to communicate love. And so sometimes we don't necessarily feel God's love, but if we become aware of all the different ways that he can love us through other people, it helps us feel more connected to his love. And this is what Paul starts with. He starts with this, this, this tension of being separated from God's love. And separated literally means here to divorce or to depart. But here's the good news. No one can separate themselves from the love of God. An atheist can't a murderer can't, a violent, hateful abuser can't, even people that hate God, that don't wanna have anything to do with them, they still are not capable, or nor do they have the ability to separate themselves from the love of God. See, you are loved whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, and whether you feel it or not. You are loved unconditionally, wholeheartedly, and continually. You are always being loved by God. That is good news for all of us today. But here's what Paul's talking about. The issue is, yeah, Mark, that, that, that's true from the Bible, great, but in experience, in real life, on Monday mornings, <laughs> on Fridays when the bills are due and I don't have the money, right? I don't always feel loved by God. And so Paul is speaking to a people that are under heavy persecution, lots of pressure, and he's identifying with what they're feeling. And he says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Why? Because all of them felt, in some form or fashion, separated from the love of God. And so he goes through all these different things. And I think a lot of these we can relate to as, as humans, but also as people of faith, especially during these last 18 months in the pandemic. He talks about tribulation. This word literally means pressure. How many of us have experienced just the pressure of life, the uncertainty of the future? When will things change? Will things ever get back to normal? Just pressure, financial pressure, relational pressure, whatever it may be. Tribulation, distress. This word literally means in the Greek like a narrow space, or you've heard the analogy of between a rock and a hard place. That You just feel, you feel trapped. I think many people during the last 18 months have felt this mentally, just being exhausted with all of these decisions and the pressure on these decisions. And then we live in the information age where we're being inundated with messages and scripts at all times, vying for our attention, trying to tell us who we are, who we should be, what we should have, what we shouldn't have, what we should be thinking, what we should be posting, what we should be doing, all these things. Paul's identifying with this. Not, not only just as a human, but also as a person of faith. Distress, persecution. You know, right now across the globe, Christians are being more persecuted than they ever have been. Over 100 million Christians are being persecuted right now, mainly in the Middle East and parts of Asia and Africa. 100 million people 
being tortured, being imprisoned, being put on trial with false trumped up accusations, many of them being martyred, murdered for their faith. This is persecution, hostility, opposition to our Christian faith. And then he goes on and talks about famine. Like Paul says in some of his letters that there were literally times where like he did not eat, not because he was trying to lose weight, but because like there was no food that famine was a very real thing in the ancient world. They didn't have distribution channels like we have now. And so when famine would hit, many people would be hurt. We see this in Africa right now because of climate change. We are seeing massive amounts of famine throughout many countries in Africa where people are dying simply because there is no food due to famine. Perhaps during COVID, you've been one that's been dangerously close to having food shortages. So many people across the Bay Area and our country have been dealing with that. These are very real things. And when you're hungry and there's no food, you don't necessarily feel God's love. Or there's hostility or opposition or tribulation or stress. It can often keep you away from the truth of God's love being available to us every moment of every day. Paul continues on, he says nakedness. Literally, there was a time where Paul like didn't have clothes to stay warm, nakedness. And then he goes on, danger, speaking of thieves and also sickness. So many people would, would get sickness in this time and that sickness would lead to death or significant impairment. And then lastly, he talks about the sword. This is literally like Roman military opposition towards the church, towards people of faith. And so many of these things we can identify with as humans just living through the pandemic in the last 18 months. And other of these elements we can identify with solely because we are followers of Jesus. Now in our culture, we, we hear these things and we, we often ask ourselves this question, why do bad things happen to good people? You ever ask that? I know I have. And every time I ask it, I'm insinuating, why are bad things happening to me? <laughs> because of course, I've, I'm a good person. I mean, I'm not that bad. I mean, why are bad things happening to me? But if we look to the scriptures, here's what becomes abundantly true. Bad things happening to good people has only happened to one person, and that is Jesus. And the bad thing that happened to him for being a good person is that he was slaughtered, he was murdered, he was crucified. And so the question isn't, why do bad things happen to good people? The question is, why do good things happen to bad people like me and like you and like every other human to live except for Jesus? The real question is, he is so merciful and gracious and gives us so much favor and he loves us so much. Why do these good things happen to us? See, bad things happen to all people, people of faith and people without any type of faith, people that love God and don't wanna have anything to do with God. Part of the human experience is that there will be suffering, there will be pain, there will be tears, but the promise that we have from Jesus is if we follow him soon and very soon, he will come back for his people and he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will be no more pain and suffering. There will be no more division or hate. There will be love in the family of God in heaven for all eternity. Pastor Rich Velotis in Queens, New York, pulls the tension of the scripture and he talks about closeness versus goodness. See, in our minds we think like, if I'm close to something, it's, it's good, but not all the time. What we've seen in the pandemic is a massive spike in domestic violence. We've seen a lot of sexual abuse towards children because people weren't working and they were all confined to a home. Closeness for many people during the pandemic did not feel good at all. But we know that the God of the Bible, that when we draw near to him and we get close to him, closeness to him is always goodness. A.W. Tozer says that the most important thing about you is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about God. Now think about it, if the first thing that comes to mind about God is that he's a judge, or he's out to get me, or he's mad at me, or, or he wants to punish me, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna withdraw. I'm not gonna wanna get near. I'm gonna wanna get as far away as possible. 
But if the first image I have of God is a loving father that is kind and, and generous and, and he's good and he's always willing to help and he's wise and he's gentle and he wants to be close to me and he's eager to get close to me because he loves me. If that's my image of God, closeness is goodness. And so if there's anything in your mind or heart that, that in, in your thinking of God that closeness equals bad, not good, we've got to turn that over to God and repent of that so that we know that all closeness with Jesus is goodness. Psalm 84, 2 says this, when I'm near you, my heart and my soul will sing. <laughs> Jesus is going to make your heart sing. You just can't help it. When you get around him, something happens on the inside. He says, I will sing and worship with my joyful songs of you, my true source and spring of life. I heard the story of a young couple that had fallen in love. And on Sundays, they would go out on this drive and they had a pickup truck and the man would drive and his wife would sit right next to him back in the day where they had like the bench seat and the pickup truck and, and he'd put his arm around her, they'd do a Sunday drive. And then a couple de decades later, they, they got into a little bit of a spat and they're sitting in the truck and they're talking and the wife looks at the husband and says, you know, we used to be so in love. We used to sit practically on each other's lap, right next to each other. And now look at you're, you're so far away. From and he looks at his, his wife of over 20 years and says, I haven't moved. He's saying that he's in the same spot. Now, we know this story could be said where the woman's driving and the man, you, you get it. But wh wh where did this distance come from? I, I didn't create the distance. And what the psalmist is saying here is that when I'm near God, when I draw close to God, he will draw close to us, meaning that we will experience his closeness. We will feel his love. And God wants us to feel his love. I mean, what father doesn't want his children to actually feel his love? Of course, God wants you to actually feel his love. But he actually wants something more than that. He's actually going after something more important. He actually wants you to trust his love even when you can't feel his love. That's a little bit deeper. That's a little bit further down the journey. See, just because you haven't felt his love or don't feel his love, that does not mean that you can't feel his love or you won't feel his love. At the end of this message, we are going to create a space, an opportunity for you to experience, and I'm believing, feel the love of God, which is so important. We want to feel it. He wants us to feel his love, but we can go deeper to this place of actually learning to trust his love. See, he wants us to trust his love even when we don't feel it. Early on in my faith journey, I would, would pray and, and read my Bible, and I was so excited about Jesus in college. And I remember I would have these encounters, these kind of rushes, these spiritual highs, where like I just felt God's love. And then as months and years passed, those became more and more infrequent and more and more less intense. And what I've learned though is my faith has actually gotten deeper, it's actually gotten stronger. I'm actually convinced that God loves me even if I don't feel it for quite some time. And I've got permission from Amanda to share this, but in many ways, it's very much like our marriage of 16 years now, where early on it was fireworks of passion all the time. You know, you talk on the phone and just, you wouldn't even say anything. You're just listening to the other person breathe on the other line, right? Like so in love, so passionate. And now like we know each other so much deeper than we did early on. We actually love each other more. We actually serve each other more than what we did. It's so much deeper than feelings. Feelings are important, but feelings cannot be trusted. Because although feelings are important, feelings are not sufficient. Now, now hear me out. D don't, don't go off the deep end here. I, I, need you to, I need you to lean in with me right here. We need to feel our feelings. And we need to create time and space and give ourselves grace to actually process them and understand them. Anger, we should feel it. Frustration, many of us during the last 18 months, grief and, and sadness and the good emotions of joy and excitement and all those things. We need to take time, space, give ourselves grace to actually process those things. But we should never fully, completely trust our feelings 
or be led by our feelings. Why? Because our feelings are constantly changing. They just, they're, they're very fleeting in many ways. They're constantly changing. But I know something that doesn't change, something that hasn't changed since before the beginning of time, and it's God's love. God loves me. Before I was even a thought in my parents' mind, he formed me in love, and he's loved me every moment of my life, and he will even after I die, as I join him in heaven for all eternity. I can trust in God's love because it doesn't change. Yes, I wanna feel God's love, but I wanna grow deeper to actually trust in his love. Rick Warren says, to feel loved by God is the starting point for every ministry, every revival, every renewal, and every great awakening. Feeling God's love is super important, but it's the starting point. It's not the finish line, and it's certainly not even the one mile marker or the 10 mile marker, because we know we're in a marathon, or the 26 mile marker, but it is the start. And many of us need to feel God's love to keep us refreshed and renewed. That's important. But we can't limit ourselves and our growth and our progress based on the feeling of God's love. We've gotta grow deeper to where we learn how to trust in God's love. Imagine if uh, we only lived by the feeling of love. If I only loved people that I felt love from. Well, in our society where everything is so fast paced and moving all the time, I don't know that I'd ever love anybody or give anybody time, right? But we see that the love that Jesus speaks about in the scripture is actually so powerful that it empowers you to love people that you don't feel love from, people that you can actually feel hate from. One of Jesus' revolutionary teachings during his time was loving your enemies. Nobody did that. But Jesus says, no, 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 my love is a different kind. My love is a supernatural kind. That when you get my love, your heart can be so changed, so transformed that you can actually want to and actually be good at loving people that don't love you at all and even hate you and hurt you. That his love is so powerful that you can love your enemies. Now, as we draw to a close here, I want you to get this, that trusting, feeling his love, learning to trust his love, even when we don't feel it, eventually leads us to this place where we are transformed by his love to love. We actually become a loving person. We don't love people because we're on good behavior or we're trying really hard. Like our natural response is love. See, trusting leads to transforming. We believe in his love for us, we receive it, sometimes feeling it, sometimes not, but always receiving it. And then what happens is we begin to see people the way he sees them. And we begin to look not to get, but rather to give and serve and help and be a part and bring healing and hope to people's lives. And this is what is in view when Paul is talking about that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, in ancient times, a conqueror was, was self-mastery. This was someone that had, had managed their emotions and they had self-control. The, the way you would talk about it in our culture right now is they are killing it or maybe kilt it, right? Like they are crushing it. They are destroying it. Why, why is our culture so violent in our language of winning? Conqueror means a decisive victory. So what Paul's saying to us today, more than a conqueror, is more than self-mastery. It's a decisive victory. If you were, if you're the, the, nobody in your family has graduated from college and you become the person that graduates from college, that's being a conqueror. If, if no one in your family has stayed married and everybody's gotten a divorce and you're the first family with a healthy marriage, that's more than a conqueror. If you're the, the person in your family where everybody's in massive amount of debt and they don't live within their means and they, they can't be generous because they've got piles of debt and you're the first person to pay off debt and, and to live generously and to put God first, that's conqueror. But what Paul's speaking about is what's more than a conqueror is actually the more is what's outside of yourself. So it's not me trying really hard to manage everything and be great at everything and perform perfectly. But no, I have an outside force called God's love 
that equips me and empowers me and helps me to go way beyond my sufficiency. I get upgraded from my best to God's best, my ability to his ability. See, more than a conqueror is me being capable of loving like Jesus loves. See, we feel his love, we receive his love, we believe in that love, we learn to trust in it, be transformed by it, and then eventually what happens is we begin to love like Jesus. That's more than a conqueror. Someone can hate me, and I'm still gonna love them. Someone can do me wrong, do me dirty. Someone can, can screw me on a business deal, and I'm still going to love. I'm still gonna take the high road. I'm still gonna believe the best of every person. I'm still gonna be patient and kind and not boastful or self-seeking. I'm not gonna keep any record of wrongs. See, this is the love that God gives us. And this is what we're capable of living like, more than a conqueror. Not through me loving him, but through him loving me. Not through my performance, not through my perfect Bible in one year attendance or Sunday church, no. It's through his love for me that I grow to become more than a conqueror, no longer limited by my best, but walking in and receiving his best. Man, that's some good news. I think all of us need a taste of that. We need to receive that today. So here's the time that I wanna take a moment and, and just create a space for us to pray right now. And if, if, if you're following along and maybe your heart's stirring, maybe you've had an emotional moment where you've felt God's love at some time during the teaching today, maybe you haven't felt anything at all, but just you have a growing trust on the inside as truth stirs your heart. And maybe you're watching and you're like, man, I do trust in this love, but I want it. I want to be transformed to love. I want to love like Jesus. Just put your hand on your heart. I want to pray for every one of us. Oh, Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that you said in Romans 5, 5, that you would pour out the Father's love through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you come right now and would you pour out that incredible love from our Father for His kids right now into your people. Fill our hearts with love. Lord, help us actually feel loved. And anything that would hinder that, that would keep us from that, Lord, help remove that obstacle so that we can fully receive and even feel your love. Jesus, we just ask that you would help us trust your love even when we don't feel it, that we lean on it, that we trust in it, that we depend upon it, that we trust in your love. And lastly, we just say, Jesus, would you transform us? Anything in our life or heart that needs to change, change it. We wanna be like you, we wanna love like you, we wanna see people like you see them. We wanna care about them like you care about that. Would you transform us into love? In Jesus' name.